Welcome back you guys. I'm Tassie and this is one of my ghostly update vlogs. So a lot of you guys have been submitting a lot of questions. I will try and touch up with a bunch of them that I can remember because I never write these down. I kind of just read them. All right. I'm sorry guys. So <laughs> I'm going to be doing a lot of follow up questions to what a lot of people have been asking me lately. And the first one, people were asking if I knew Chinese before I actually started to wanting be a shaman. I did not know Chinese, you guys. Um, it was really weird when it actually happened. And this is exactly what happened. So this is how I learned to speak Chinese. And when I went into the spirit world, this is when I already had my first shrine. So I had my first shrine. If you guys remember in my stories about the first time entering the spirit world and how I didn't want to repeat the words I was saying because they didn't sound like real words. So it's kind of like, it, imagine you heard a Chinese person talking and you're trying to repeat what they're saying. <laughs> That's exactly what it was like. So I didn't want to repeat those words that I was hearing because it didn't make sense. So what happened was, this is when I had my first shrine already and only the first shrine. And it was literally, I was going in the spirit world and all of a sudden I come across this dirt road and there is this beautiful Chinese lady sitting on this rock. And she's like, she it was her side profile and then she was just like looking at me as I came up, up to her. And then it was like a wall broke and it was just, burr, all this Chinese came out. It was, that's exactly what happened. And she literally looked like, you know, like if anybody has those Joss incense sticks, those Chinese drawings basically of like the ancient ones and the clouds. That's exactly what she looked like. But she was like in real life and she was really pretty with super straight long hair. But that's exactly what happened. And so like since then, um, speaking Chinese from my spirit guides, this is not me. It is not like another language I learned or anything like that. I do not have the, a knack for linguistics <laughs> whatsoever. So it's really funny because when I was younger, I went all the way to French 5. And then when you get to French 5, your French teacher just makes you grade other French students' homework. So that's kind of what it is. And then, But then I made the mistake of taking Spanish 1. <laughs> and when you do that, it messes me up like crazy because all of the words started getting jumbled. I couldn't remember what was French and what was Spanish anymore. It was terrible. So, uh, yeah, I have no knack for languages whatsoever. <laughs> and uh, so, yeah. I learned that strictly just from my spirit guides. I only know what my spirit guides tell me. And then I was asked basically, you know like how if you guys go to some Hmong houses and they have um, Hmong money on their door frame and they also have like these wooden swords with like sometimes red X's and sometimes people tie strings on these wooden things. So the wooden swords is actually kakong. It's a version of kakong. And only certain people know how to do it. And it is a form of protection so that really strong demons don't come in. Now, of course, sometimes if people have a ghost with them and it's following an individual and they come into your house, it will leave with them. It won't actually stay in that house. So that's what it is. Uh, the Hmong money, it's more of just like uh, some people call it protection. Some people it's for good luck. So some families do that. It really just depends on the family if they are traditional in that sense, like a sika and everything. Typically, if you have a sika, you do that paper at the same time as the sika. So, and then I was also asked about the tools that a lot of Hmong shamans tend to use. So that is something that your teacher or would-be teacher actually would teach you. So I wouldn't teach you guys only because you're not my direct student. So I wouldn't tell you. And these stories, you guys, are really going to be like just general stories and experiences that I encounter and that from other shamans that I've heard of. So I don't tell you guys a lot of what they would call tsunki, which is basically like the real magic workings of things because I can only do that to my students. So my own spare guys don't allow me to talk about certain things. So along that line, typically if you have a teacher or if you have somebody who's really into the shaman world, they may tell you what it is for, used for, etc. But I can't tell you guys that. I'm sorry. Now, somebody had emailed me, and I actually haven't gotten back to them. I'm really busy with work, you guys, and my other channel. And then the holidays are coming up. My boyfriend, his birthday is coming up, too. So it's, like, all hitting me really hard right now. <laughs> but I did get an email about um, somebody who gets slept on a lot. Like, 
a lot. You really should have somebody look into that. That is not normal whatsoever. And sometimes people have asked about like some people they sleep with a sword under their pillow you know so that is also a form of what you would call kakong or people use it as protection to protect them against bad spirits bad demons i will tell you that typically it will work for a while but then things can break through that and it's with the inner workings of you need magic spells on those actual items typically and then that's how it'll work and stick longer um as a freebie tip i will give you guys those who have uh especially like little children who suffer from really bad nightmares um even if you're an adult and you're going through it light a candle or else uh what i, I recommend what i always tell people who come see me so, you know, like during the holidays, and it's a good thing because we're during the holidays, so you can run out and go buy it. During the holidays, it's really common, even like at your local Walmart, to find those uh, fake candles. It's actually a light that you plug in and you just flick it and it comes on, but it looks like a candle. So you would just light that and have it turned on when you're sleeping. And that typically helps you through your dreams so that you don't face a lot of bad stuff. Now, I will also say though, if you guys have the candle light on, you know, sometimes people will have nightmares after a couple months, a few months. So it really depends on the, like, if it's like, okay, if it's something light and it's not super serious, you know, typically the candle alone or the, having the little light switch, like a night light, you can use a night light if you want. Having the night light and stuff, it actually helps for like smaller things. But if it's something heavier and bigger, in time it's gonna break through that light and be able to get your to your child again or to you. And it's really funny because when I was younger, for some reason I always had a night light. Like I, I don't know why, but I always had a night light. Uh, this was when I was in that house and the demon Michael attached himself to me. So I always had a night light on for some reason. But yeah, so, you know, definitely I recommend you guys trying that if you're having a lot of nightmares. You just don't feel that good when you're sleeping and you're having a lot of bad nightmares. Oh, let's see. What else was asked of me? <laughs> I get, like, a lot of questions. I'm so sorry. I try to respond to everybody's comments, but sometimes, like, it'll take me a few days and then I'll get back to you. So, an interesting update. Uh, the other night, it was a weeknight. My boyfriend, he actually came over to pick me up and I was going to go and sleep over there. And I'm like rushing and I'm grabbing all my stuff for work the next day. And I'm throwing it over my shoulder and I'm heading out of my apartment. And as I'm leaving, I hear in Hmong this voice that says, she thought the moon, you know, and I was like, whatever. And then, uh, oh, and by the way, that means don't go yet. <laughs> and I'm like, whatever. So then I go to the door and then all of a sudden I hear a voice in English this time and the voice in English says, don't go yet. And I'm like, hmm, <laughs> the door's closing and I'm locking it. I'm like, whatever. <laughs> so like I'm heading downstairs. I'm about to leave my physical building when all of a sudden I stop and I'm like, I feel like something's off. And then I look down. I'm wearing my gym shoes instead of my work shoes. <laughs> So then I had to run all the way back upstairs and then go change into my work shoes. And the reason for that is if I'm sleeping over at my boyfriend's house, especially if I'm going to work the next day, I become really irate the next morning if I have to stop at my apartment just to get something because I forgot it. I'm pretty terrible about that. So I was like, oh, thank you. Thank you to the universe for telling me. I would have been so mad. <laughs> all right last couple of questions I was also asked so typically when you are a fledgling shaman and you've just started especially if you're just on your first shrine you should stay away from funeral homes and only is because you're more susceptible to those type of demons hurting you and injuring you and a lot of times demons will try to injure early shamans to try and stunt them because of what you can do in the future which is basically destroy them. So, you know, it, it makes sense for them to try and attack you now <laughs> while you're still weak. So that's why it's strongly advised stay away from funeral homes. And then the last question I was asked, if I remember it correctly, it was basically about, um, is it okay to have a shrine to just pray at? And is it true that it opens up doors for other things to come through? Yes, to both. <laughs> so, you know, a lot of times when, um, when, when there are shamans who are supposed to be a shaman, but they haven't fully accepted it, maybe they don't have the money yet, they haven't found a teacher yet, they haven't et cetera, et cetera, 
not ready yet for whatever reason, they will just open up a small shrine and we call it Poropo, which is basically like for a kid is kind of what it means. But, uh, and it's just so that <laughs> like so that you can like be be okay you know because sometimes um sometimes if you can't control your spirit guides especially with when it involves your emotions then your spirit guides will drive that shaman individual kind of crazy so if you write if you raise a small little shrine for them then it will make them happy so that they'll like kind of leave you alone so you're not as crazy but uh, some people, you know, they'll pray at, at their shrine, you know, and, and that's perfectly fine. It's just um, uh, some people, they'll meditate by the shrine, you know, but you could pray. It, it, it's really, really up to you. And um, sometimes because it's a small shrine, what will sometimes happen is that other spirits may come and touch it. And it's also kind of signifying that it's touching your spirit guides. And then your spirit guides are very, very dirty. And there's a way to cleanse yourself if that ends up happening. But you should really consult your teacher um, or other shamans that you know on how to cleanse yourself. If you're going to be a shaman but you're not one yet. And you feel kind of sick or anything like that. There is a method to cleanse yourself. So, oh yeah. And so this one individual had asked me about... Um, in another video, I had mentioned that everybody has spirit guides. Yes, everybody has spirit guides. Doesn't matter if you're a mom or not, you guys. Everybody has spirit guides. And typically when I'm around people, I can see different types of spirit guides. I'm going to let you guys know too. So I used to do tarot cards. And one of the things, whenever I did tarot cards, right? This is exactly what happened to me whenever I did tarot cards. So I would... Um, Typically, when you do tarot cards, you have the individual pick out the cards. However, for me, you don't actually have to be there. So if you just contacted me online or like texted me, like my friends, they would just text me because we weren't always around each other. And then I would actually pull the cards for you. So if you're pulling it, then your guides are actually helping you pick out the cards, right? So then if I'm pulling it for you, what I do is I actually will see you and then beyond you, I actually see your guides. And then of course your ancestors and your family and they will pull the cards for me and then my hands will actually take out the correct card that they want. So um, everybody has spirit guides and I was also asked like, can you send them to go and protect people? So <laughs> I'm sorry about my face. Um, you can, if you have that ability, if you don't have that ability, you cannot. So if you don't have that ability, you can't actually use your own spare guys to go and protect somebody, especially if you are not like an individual who is very connected to their spare guides, meaning you can see and interact with them and you can control them. Because that's essentially what it is. So shamans, uh, you know, different types of people. There's different cultures who have shamans. They have a connection to their spirit guide so that they can control and tell them what to do. Not always because a lot of times they will do things. <laughs> I'm just saying in, in general. Um, typically, like for my own guides, they will not do it unless it is somebody directly related by blood. Like it would have to be like my spouse or my children. Um, very seldom would they actually do it for even like a sibling. It would really, really depend on the situation, but they are more inclined to be that if something happens, it's kind of like it's their problem unless they come and ask us for help because then that's something I would have to go into the spirit world and one do or like undo and take care of. But it's, um... I don't know, like my guides are telling me that it's considered rude for you to just see, which is like order your spirit guides to do something that they shouldn't be doing because their main purpose is to protect the one person they were born with, right? Because everybody has spirit guides. And when things, certain things happen in people's lives, it was meant to happen. Even if it seems really tragic. Oh, and I want to bring up, okay, I'm like everywhere now. I'm <laughs> sorry. I do that a lot. <laughs> So, yeah, but it, it's considered rude if you're trying to get your spirit guides to do that. And it's actually not good for you only because sometimes your spirit guides won't know how to come back. So, you know, there's a lot of ifs and different situations. Basically, at the end of the day, 
don't do it unless you know how to do it. Uh, most people can't even do it, even if they tried. So, you know, but it, it's it's possible, especially if you have that ability, you know. So some people who aren't technically called a shaman, and a shaman is really just a term that we use, but it's if you have that spiritual connection, you could. You got to know what you're doing, though. <laughs> All right, you guys. So that concludes my Q&A for today. <laughs> I have been super busy. I am so sorry I missed last week. I will try and do another video, but I will see because everything's really hectic for me right now. All right, you guys. Thanks for watching.